Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hello, family. Thank you for having me. My name is Alex. I'm a grateful recovered addict and alcoholic. Um, I always start off by saying that I'm very nervous because I usually am. This never gets any easier for me. I am um, profoundly uncomfortable speaking in front of groups of people, and yet I find myself oftentimes speaking in AA and leading big book studies and whatnot. And so you know, my prayer is just that God's word, God's word will move through me and that I can be of service. Um, So thank you for having me. Thank you for all the hosts and co-hosts and uh, some of the smiling faces that I see around the room that I know. Um, I'm really grateful to be here on a Tuesday, what is for me a rainy afternoon in New York. Um, So we're going to talk about step 10 and 11. And um, I tried not to prepare too much because I really wanted to just see what comes. But um, you know, I want to just talk for a minute about my history, because I think that that's really important for me to kind of get centered in um, in how I got to where I am today. And so um, I started using, I was about 12 or 13 years old. It was exactly what I was looking for. Um, nothing felt as good as a drink felt. And um, it was like I had arrived, right? There was this moment of intense belonging and feeling and the desire to escape the reality of my life. And so, you know, I, I went on that way for a really long time. I got sober about eight years ago and, um, I was 31 when I came into the rooms and, um, here we are today. And, uh, and I've been sober consistently for eight years and it's the only thing I've ever done in my life consistently ever, you know? And so that, that's the power of this program. And, and, um, you know, I, I drank with a sincere sensation to, escape the reality of my life. The big book talks about, we like the effect produced by alcohol. And I enjoyed the effect that it produced because the effect that it produced for me was that I could numb out. I could withdraw. I did not have to feel the reality of my life. And the reality of my life was very uncomfortable. There was a lot of um, early childhood trauma. There was a lot of loss. There was a lot of pain. There was a lot of a desire to fit in somewhere. And I found that through, uh, through alcohol. And so, um, when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, I had no, I, I had no idea what this program had to offer. You know, I, I had $25 in my bank account. I hadn't paid my rent in several months. I was hitting my knees every night, hysterically crying because I couldn't figure out why I was in so much pain and why my life looked the way my life looked. And, um, I thought when I came in that like, okay, this is going to be a way that's going to get me to figure out how to just get some money in the bank, how to get my life a little bit together and what to do. Um, I had no idea that it was going to take me to a place beyond my wildest dreams. And I had no idea that it was going to fulfill the desire that I've had since I was a very little girl of creating a connection with a higher power that was going to change my life in, in immeasurable ways. And so, um, and so I want to share this story because I think it's kind of kind of interesting. But um, when I was three years old, my mother was in the hospital with me. And my father, who at the time was a drug addict and alcoholic himself, um, was in and out of church and in and out of finding a relationship with God and in and out of finding recovery. And um, he had found this church. And when my mother left the hospital, the very first place they took me was to a church revival when I was three days old. And so I like to say, since hearing that story a couple of years back, that like my spirit, my soul has been searching and longing for a connection to God since the day I was born. You know what I mean? Like I have been longing for this thing that I couldn't quite understand. And I searched in a lot of places for it. You know, I searched in yoga. I searched in Buddhism, Christianity, um, Hinduism, Hare Krishna, different philosophies, now Judaism. Like I have searched my whole life for some sense of connection with something greater than myself that was going to heal this deep seated wound within me that I just couldn't figure out where it was, where it was coming from. And so, so I think I've been searching for this my whole life. And, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous was the last house on the block. It's the only thing that's worked for me. And it's the only thing that's been able to give me a set of tools 
that I've been able to use on a daily basis to draw me closer to that connection with God. And so, um, so another quick story, when I was nine years old, my father died of AIDS. He was a heroin addict, he was an alcoholic, and he'd been a junkie since he was the time he was 15 years old. And uh, when I was nine, he passed away from, from AIDS. And it was just, I mean, it was the single most impactful thing that's happened in my life. It was a loss that is sometimes unbearable today to even talk about, you know, like the fact that I can share about it without crying or, or kind of falling into a, a wallop of a mess, you know, it's the work in this program, the work that I've had to do, right? But that loss really had such a, a giant impact on me. And I didn't find out until later on that, you know, about his own drug addiction and his own struggles. I found that on later on in life, but there was a sense of abandonment that I didn't know was so heavy, right? For a nine-year-old kid, it was just a heavy feeling to have. And so at nine years old, I started writing letters to God. And, um, and so this has been a, a form that has stayed with me throughout my entire life where things are bad, things are good, things are indifferent, things are neutral. I sit down and I write these letters to God. And it's sort of a way of communicating with my higher power that I've found helps ease the anxiety and the fear and the frustration and the stress level. And it allows me to draw closer and connect. And so, you know, some people do two-way prayer, which I have practiced along the course of my sobriety as well. But these Dear God letters are really just this, this communication that I have that's very intimate in my relationship with my higher power. And so with that, I kind of want to shift into what this 10 and 11 looks like for me. And so I'm going to read a little bit from the book. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what this practice is. But I think it's really important for me to point out that, you know, I didn't understand that when I first started working the steps, that steps one, two, and three really come alive for me in steps 10 and 11, right? Like there's this idea in step three, this concept of God becoming, you know, the father, the principal, the agent, right? Like there's these relationships that it talks about in the third step and about not running the show, right? And turning my will and my life over. And once I take that third step decision, it sort of becomes an affirmation that I make every single day as I move forward in my recovery, right? I'm no longer turning my will over. I'm just course correcting. I have a friend, Samantha M., who likes to say, God is like the GPS, and I just get back on the highlighted route, right? It's like rerouting to the highlighted route. And that's my relationship with God today in my third step is every day I wake up and I reaffirm this relationship with my higher power. And so, so I understand now, having had done this work and continuing to do this work, the power that that third step decision, it comes alive in my 10th and 11th step. And so I'm just going to read a little bit about step 10. It says, we suggest we continue to take personal inventory and continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along. We vigorously commence this way of living as we cleaned up the past. We have entered the world of the spirit. Our next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. This is not an overnight matter. It should continue for our lifetime. And so it's telling me that I've entered the world of the spirit. So after I do my ninth step, after I clean up and I make my amends, I've entered the world of the spirit. I'm no longer living in the same plane that I was living in before right? I'm not living in selfishness, dishonesty, fear, frustration. I'm starting to live in the spiritual realm, right? This idea that the spirit is now what has power over my mind, over my body, over my thoughts, over the way I act, right? Like it, it's almost as though something else is controlling me, right? Like I don't even have to try or fight or fend off for myself. I don't have to manipulate the world anymore, which is what I did when I was active, right? I manipulated every situation so I could get out of it what I needed to get out of it in order for me to feel safe and okay. But I go through this process of, you know, steps four through nine and doing this inventory and taking these action steps and cleaning up the past. And I arrive in this 10th step and now I'm in the world of the spirit. And it says it should continue for a lifetime. Now I know, I know it's one day at a time. It talks about it all. We, we hear it all the time, one day at a time, spiritual daily reprieve, all of the things. But this instruction tells me that I need to be doing this work for my lifetime, which is very clearly a, an idea that I'm not just doing this one day at a time. I'm doing this for the rest of my life. And as I move forward in my recovery, I'm not looking at it as just one day at a time. I'm looking at this as my life. Because if I answered the question honestly, to live on a spiritual basis or to die an alcoholic death, 
How can I say I'm just living one day at a time? For me, that's been my experience. I can't live like that. I need to live as though this is the course I'm taking for the rest of my life, that this is a lifeline I've been given. I'm on borrowed time. How many times I should have been dead? How many bad things that could have been happened ha- that could have happened to me? How many times I could have been raped, cut, fallen off a subway platform, hit by a train, hit by a car, gotten into a car accident, right? Like numerous times that like my life for me would have looked very differently. And so I've got to look at this thing that I'm going to continue for me for a lifetime. And so my step 10 is going to give me some really clear instructions. And one thing that I was taught to do, and and I love this idea was, I'm going to go into it, but it says, continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. When these crop up, we ask God at once to remove them. We discuss them with someone and make amends quickly. Then we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. So three actions I'm given, watch, ask, turn. So what I was taught to do is I was learning how to really practice this 10 step in my everyday life was to set the timer on my phone for random times throughout the day. And the highlight on the timer on my phone was watch, ask, turn. So at randomly three o'clock in the afternoon, my timer goes off and it's a reminder to watch, ask, and turn. And so I did this for about a year on my phone. I still have them set. But I did this for about a year where it would go off at 6 o'clock in the morning, 10 a.m., noon, 3 p.m., 4.45 in the evening. It would just go off at random times. And it would be that reminder to turn to God, to watch for these things, and to ask God to remove them at once. And I've had so many experiences in my work life, in my relationships life, where these these alerts have come up on my phone and I felt so disconnected throughout the day, it's brought me back to that connection with my higher power. Because it's not about this meeting. It's about how I act when I leave this meeting. It's about my reaction to life, my response, right? And those are very, those are two very different things. A reaction to a situation versus a response to something, right? I don't have to react today. I can respond intelligently, guided by God. I can, re- I can respond in a way that's guided by this program with love and tolerance and kindness as my code. And I didn't know that when I first came in very early on. I didn't understand how to really work with the tools of this program. People talk a lot about like, oh, I'm working, I'm living in steps 10, 11, and 12, or I'm working on this, or I'm working on that. I never had tangible things to do until I started working the program in the way I work it now. And so, and so I watch and I ask and I turn, and I turn my thoughts to someone I can help. And I work a lot with the prayers throughout the day, right? Especially the prayers from the fourth step. There's four columns of inventory. There's four different prayers in there that I can work with. There's prayers throughout this entire big book, right? There's there's endless amounts of opportunity for me to draw inspiration from this book and to also draw inspiration from outside sources, from other things that I read, from things I hear on these meetings, from people that I talk to on a daily basis. Um, you know, Matt's on this call. I can't tell you how many times, you know, I have a moment in the day where I reach out to Matt or, you know, reach out to my friend, Kevin, who's also on this call, just people in my life today who are working this program in a way in which I want what they have and, and they want what I have. And we get to share in this recovery thing together. Right. And so I utilize that throughout my day as I watch, as I ask, and as I turn towards God and turn towards being of service to another human being. And so I'll keep going here. It says love and tolerance of others is our code. We've ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol for at this time, sanity will return. And then it goes into the 10 step promises. And I'm not going to read through all of them. But what I really want to say is that as I arrive in this 10 step promise, the obsession to remove to drink has been removed, at least for me, I've been graced with the gift that it is not my friend Matt likes to say, like, I don't think about drinking, I don't think about not drinking, right? Like I went to a Shabbat dinner a couple weeks back, I went into a liquor store to buy a bottle of wine, it wasn't I'm immune, right? Like the problem has been removed. There's no desire. The taste has been taken out of my mouth. And that is this gift as I arrive in these 10 step promises. You know what I mean? It says it doesn't, instead of the problem has been removed, it does not exist for us. It no longer exists for me today. That is the grace that I've been given through working the 12 steps of alcoholic and alcoholics anonymous and of creating a relationship with a higher power that I can tap into the source every single moment of my life. And so, you know, my 10th step today is living it every single day. And so I'll share uh, briefly one more story about this. 
Um, so I have, I have a new job, which I don't love, but I do it and I'm grateful for it, but I have a new job that I don't love. And anyone who's heard me speak over the course of the past two years of the pandemic knows that I had a job that I loved. I lost the job due to the pandemic. I went unemployed for a bunch of months. I got another job I hated, left that job, started this job. And like, this job is just fine. You know, it is what it is. It's a job. It's a paycheck. I go to work every day. I'm able to be of service. And that's that. So I had this moment where I'm having a conversation with one of the women who work in the marketing team. And I'm blatantly asking a question because in my mind, what they're doing marketing wise for this one location makes no sense, right? And so I've caught her, sort of like call her out on the spot. Like, well, why are we doing it this way when blah, 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 blah. Now she walks away, I walk away. About three minutes later, I come back and I realize, oh my God, I was such a B-I-T-C-H. That was so rude of me. Why did I say it? Why did I have to point that out? Like, so what? Who cares if you disagree with the marketing plan? Like, it's not your team. It's not your job. That's not your role. It doesn't matter. So I have this moment three minutes later where I recognize the action. I recognize that I was being selfish. I recognize that I was being rude. And I wanted to immediately apologize. And she left. She had already left. So now I'm sitting there for the rest of the day thinking about this conversation I had and how I can make it right, right? And so that's me watching for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear, right? I didn't need to share my opinion. I didn't need to share my thoughts. I, it didn't matter, right? I need to stay in my own lane. It's none of my business. What they do is none of my business. It doesn't affect what I do on the operational side of things. So it was fine. Nothing needed to be said, but now I owe this woman an, an apology. So anyway, moving forward into my step 11, I take the things that, I watching, that I'm watching for throughout the day and I bring that into my step 11. How do I do that? Because in step 11, there's several things that are happening. And one of the things it says is when I retire at night, I constructively review my day. And it's going to ask me several questions. And these are questions that I ask myself. Was I resentful? Was I selfish? Was I dishonest or afraid? do I owe an apology? So I take the actions of my day-to-day -day that I'm watching for, that I'm asking God for help with, that I'm turning to, help, to where I can be of service. I'm taking that into this step 11 nightly review. And I believe that that's why the 10th step starts, or sorry, the 11th step starts with when we retire at night, because it's asking me to take my entire day and all of the actions of my day and bring it into this nightly review. And so I go through these questions. Have I kept something to myself? Um, was I kind and loving towards all? I wasn't kind and loving, right? I, I needed to give that woman an apology for, for calling her out and kind of being rude, right? It says, was I thinking of what I could pack into the stream of life or what I could do for others? And it gives me really clear instructions on what I'm asking myself in this nightly review. And so in that example, I called my sponsor. I had a conversation with my sponsor about it. I no longer had an opportunity to make prompt amends. So what was I to do? Was I to seek her out and make an amends? Or was I to just live better in a different way when dealing with the marketing team, specifically her? And so that's what I did moving forward, right? I changed my entire attitude. I changed my relationship with marketing. And really what happened next was I was able to be of service to the marketing team on the next project that came up. And so the next project, they needed help with a bunch of things. And I volunteered my time. I volunteered to go around to the different locations that they needed stuff done. And I made an amends through an action. And so it was really beautiful because now when I see this woman who I had that interaction with, it's like nothing ever happened. I've been able to be of service to her. She's been super sweet to me. And now the relationship has changed. And I look at it by way of how can I how can I be of service? How can I bring God into this relationship at work? And so I'm afforded that opportunity in every area of my life. Now, work is the biggest one, right? Relationships are another big one. I recently got engaged, um, which is like super exciting. Thank you. I know. Yay. Um, it's fantastic, right? But there's all this stuff that comes with it. There's all this stuff that comes with having a partner, having a relationship, you know, we're going to move in together. We're going to get married. We're going to, he has kids. So I'm going to be a stepmom. What does that relationship look like now? Right? So I'm afforded the opportunity in all of these areas of my life to constantly be asking myself, how do I bring God into this relationship? God's already there.
God already exists in that relationship. It's where I'm not able to see God in that relationship where I get blocked or where I forget. And that's what I'm constantly working on is my conscious contact with God. So when I enter into that relationship where God already exists, I can tap into the source of that power. And there's a great, um, there's a great idea and it comes from, I, I can't even remember where it comes from, but it's, um, it might be from some Hinduism book or something that I read, but it's the idea is that, or the quote I should say is that one who sees me in everything and everything in me. I am never lost to them, nor are they lost to me. And the idea behind it is that God already exists in everything. Can I see God in everything? And if I can, can I see everything in God? So every encounter that I start to have as I come into this step 11 practice is already a spiritual encounter because conscious contact with God changes the way I see everything in my life. So now I'm here at night and I'm doing this nightly review and I realize the things that I need to course correct and I go to sleep, right? And I wake up in the morning and what do I do? It says, let me think about the 24 hours ahead. I consider my plans for the day. Before I begin, I ask, another ask, right? There's a prayer. I ask God to direct my thinking, asking that it be divorced from self-pity, dishonest, or self-seeking motives. So this thing that I'm working with when I go to bed at night, and I wake up the next morning, I take that into the next morning and I take that into prayer and meditation the next morning. And I ask God to direct my thinking. I ask God to guide me in this area and every other area of my life. And within that framework, I work a lot with the third and the seventh step prayer. And I work with those prayers because I believe in my experience, I'm working in that relationship. I'm affirming the relationship with God in my third step. He is the creator. He is my creator. He is my father, right? He is my principal. So I'm working with that concept in a way that God direct me, God guide me. And then in my seventh step prayer, I'm working with this idea of take all of me, right? Take this bitch, take this attitude that I just gave this woman, take this attitude that I just gave this woman in the marketing team and remove it from me. Let me be of service to you. And I do that with everything that crops up throughout my daily life. And sometimes I write it down on paper. Sometimes I jot it down in the notes in my phone. Sometimes it's just a silent meditation that I'm making that note and I'm praying to God and I'm in my meditation practice and I'm just kind of in my heart, turning it over and giving it to God. But that's how I work with what comes up on a day-to-day basis. Because if I'm not actively working with it and bringing it into my morning, then I'm just going about my day I'm running the show and it's out there. Mark Houston likes to talk about, he gets in the car, fear's driving him around all day. It's like, okay, fear, drive me around all day because that's all it is. It's a hundred different forms of fear and they dress up in all sweet sorts of outfits and it looks real pretty and it looks real good, but it's fear tried and true. And so in my mornings, I really work with this stuff in a way that has become a, a distinct It's a distinct change in my life because now as I go about my day, I remember what I did that morning, right? And the timers come up on my phone and it says, watch, ask, turn. And I'm reminded of that practice in the morning. So I'm constantly moving in that direction of, okay, God, what would you have me be? What would you have me do? Where would you have me go? What would you have me say? How can I be of service in this moment? What's the opportunity here for me to bring you? Because I might be the only version of a big book somebody sees. I might be the only version of Alcoholics Anonymous that someone ever interacts with. And a lot of people that I work with, they know I'm sober, but they don't know I'm an Alcoholics Anonymous. So I get to be a representative of the power of this program. And so I want to live in a way that is honorable, right? And that's where I'm at today is wanting to live in this way that is honest and true. And so that's my at night, that's my on awakening. And then it really talks about prayer and meditation, right? And it's going to talk a lot about concluding this prayer of meditation. It's going to talk about, we ask our wives or our friends to join us, right? It's going to tell me to be be quick to see where religious people are, right? It's going to give me all of these sort of ideas of things that I can do. And so what I want to kind of talk a a little bit about, you know, this prayer and meditation, like I, I spoke about earlier, I've been writing these dear God letters since I'm nine years old. I've been seeking the comfort of a higher power since I'm a child. I carried the death of my father and the trauma of my childhood into sobriety. 
I was like four years sober before I went to do a graveside amends to my father's grave at my father's grave. Right now, by all accounts, I didn't do anything right. He died when I was nine. But what could I have done as a kid that really I owed my father an amends? But what I did was I held on to that. And I let it fuel the fire. And I created a storyline in my life that allowed me to justify my using and getting loaded. And so that graveside amends that I made was one of the most powerful moments in my recovery because it allowed me to let God into the relationship with my dead dad. And so I never understood when people talked about, you need a bigger God. People say, get a bigger God. No one ever says what that actually means. And I had this profound experience while I'm sitting at my father's gravesite and I'm crying and I'm praying and I'm talking to my dad and I'm praying and I'm talking to God and I'm crying and I'm just sitting there having this moment. And it was like, suddenly I realized getting a bigger God meant I needed to incorporate the spirit of my father into the spirit of my higher power. And I needed to look at the spirit of my father, because I believe that, that, that the spirit of my father is with me. And I needed to now incorporate that into my relationship with God. And that my father became no longer just a man who was dead and abandoned me because of his own alcohol, his alcoholism and drug addiction. But his spirit became something that now was with me in that moment. And when I tell you the grass got greener and the sky got bluer and everything shifted, and it was like, and all of a sudden, like I felt safe and protected in a way that I had never known before. And so for me, I now know what it means when someone says, get a bigger God, because I needed to expand the possibility of what my higher power was capable of doing and also what the energy of my higher power included. Right. And so when I came, came in, when I grew up, you know, I grew up with a Christian God, very, um, you know, fire and brimstone that right. Grace wasn't a thing yet. Pastors and preachers weren't talking about grace back in the early eighties. You know what I mean? It just wasn't a thing. It was very much, um, it was a different experience back then. And so now this idea that my higher power is a mix an incorporation, a relationship, a, a loving, graceful, higher power that wants for me all of the best of the things in the world that I want for myself. And so my prayer and meditation practice ebbs and flows through different, different variations, right? I Two-way prayer, meditation through apps, sitting quietly, counting my breath, sometimes rolling out my yoga mat and just laying on my back and feeling my body. Um, I've since gotten certified. I'm a 500 hour certified yoga instructor. So I've got meditation practices under my belt that I never knew before until I did those certifications and those trainings. And I really have sought out and continue to seek out what the prayer and meditation practice looks like in my life. And so I'll share, and this is the first time I'm sharing this on a meeting actually, but, um, my fiance is Jewish and I converted to Judaism. I've been converting over the course of the past year and a half. And so now I've got a whole slew of prayers under my belt that also incorporate Judaism. And there's a beautiful prayer in the morning that I say, and it's basically thanking God for allowing me to wake up in the morning. And I was the type of person who used to stay up at night spinning, just the world was spinning, rethinking everything that I've ever done in my life, unable to fall asleep because I'm afraid I'm going to die in my sleep. And so I've now have a set of prayers and tools that I can use that help calm me at night and pacify me at night. And then when I wake up in the morning, I'm able to give thanks and give gratitude for being awake and being alive, right? And then I sit down and I do my practices. I write my letters to God. I write out a gratitude list with a sober girlfriend. I work with the third and the seventh step prayer. I say a bunch of other prayers that are that I'm also fortunate enough to have from different principles and practices that I've studied over the years. And so this prayer and meditation thing is so much more than just, it's so much more than just prayer is talking to God and meditation is listening. It's I get to co-create my life today. I get to create a life within my relationship with my higher power, where I'm constantly tapping into the spirit of the universe, where I'm constantly connecting to the source that is within and without. 
It is both within me and outside of me. It is all encompassing, right? Like that, like that little quote I said before, if God is in everything and God is in everyone, then I'm never lost to God, nor is God lost to me. All I have to do is be awake. I just have to be awake to that which is already there. So when I wake up, it's already, God's already with me. When I walk in an elevator, which anybody who knows me knows that I have terrible claustrophobia, I get on an elevator. I have to pray the moment I walk in that elevator, God, please get me to where I'm going safely, safely and quickly. I struggle. I live in Manhattan. I got to take the subway. I'm claustrophobic. I got to get on the train every single day and face that fear. And I do that because God's already there. And so that's how I work my prayer and meditation practice throughout my day, throughout my morning, and when I go to sleep at night. It's a constant opportunity for me to grow towards that which is already there. And so as I grow, God gets bigger. As my practices change and ebb and flow, as I get unblocked from God. You see, God, I'm not, I'm not blocked from God. I'm blocked from within myself. And that blockage within myself keeps me feeling separated from God. But the truth is I'm part and parcel. And so this idea that like, if I go to the ocean and I scoop up a cup of water from the ocean and I bring it all the way back to where I live, is that cup of water not still the ocean? Are I not still part and parcel to that which is in the universe, to that which is the spirit of the universe? So I'm, a, I'm already a part of. The problem is that I think I'm separate. The problem is that my disillusioned thinking, my alcoholic thinking that wants me to be apart from, I like to call it the committee in my brain, right? The anxiety, the fear, the jealousy, the frustration, the coveting of something that my neighbor had, so somebody's further along in their career than I am, whatever that looks like. But I'm part and parcel. So that which is already there is what I awaken to. And so I could go on about prayer and meditation, but I'm, I'm looking at the clock and I guess I'll just say this. If you don't have one, if you're struggling with one, find what works for you and make a start. Because 164, the big book says, we trudge the road to happy destiny. Sometimes it's a trudge. I don't want to pray and meditate. I don't want to say those prayers. I don't want to hit my knees. I don't want to write the gratitude list. I'm tired. I woke up late or it's nighttime and I don't want to do it. And it's like, I'm constantly coming back to the space of which I know these are tools that I get to use. Not that I have to use but that I get to use because I want to live free. And if I want to live free, then I'm going to do what those who live free before me did, right? Like my sponsor has what I want. So if I want what she has, then I got to do what she does. And this is what she does. And this is where I'm fortunate enough to have this tradition in my life that like, it is no BS. It is do the deal or die. And again, coming back to that idea to live on a spiritual basis or to die an alcoholic death. And we're the only group of people that's like, hold on, let me think about it. What kind of death are you talking about? How am I going to die? What kind of death? Right? Like we contemplate it as though it's, it's a heavy print, as though it's like something hard to swallow. It's like living on a spiritual basis is not so tough. It's not so hard. And in fact, it is more simple than living the way I used to live. Right? And so that's what I'm fortunate enough to have in my life today. And so I'll kind of move on a little bit into this last, this last little bit. Um, so we talked about at night, we talked about in the morning, and then we talked about prayer and meditation. And we talked about as I go through my day and the instruction in the, at the end of step 11 is that as I go through my day, I pause when agitated or doubtful. I ask again, a prayer. I ask for the right thought or action. I constantly remind myself, I'm no longer running the show, humbly saying to myself many times each day, thy will be done. We are in then much less danger of excitement, fear, anger, worry, self-pity, or foolish decisions. We become much more efficient. We do not tire so easily, for we are not burning up energy foolishly, as we did when we were trying to arrange life to suit ourselves. And so these concepts that I talked about early on, the third step concepts now become a way of life in my 11th step practice, right? God is the father, I am the child. He is the director, I am the actor. He is the principal, I am the agent right? These concepts become a reality when I get up off my butt and go out into my everyday life and start to live 10 and 11. Because 10 and 11 is not just something that I practice at home by myself or talk about on this meeting. It has to be something that I live each day in my life. And so if it shows up as an action, what are the steps that I take? Well, it's all those things we talked about in step 11. It's all that stuff we just talked about in step, in step 10, right? 
watching, pausing, turning, asking, asking God to remove my fear and direct my attention, asking God to guide my thought and my action, asking how I can be of service, watching for when fear crops up. I have a, I had a previous job that I was at that I loved. It was my dream job. And I can remember one day walking by someone that I worked with on the street and I had my AirPods in and I heard them say my name and they didn't see me walking by them. And I immediately spiraled into fear, immediately thought of all the things they were talking about, blah, 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 blah. I get back to the office 30 minutes later and the girl who I saw walking down the street who said my name said, oh, hey, Alex, we were just talking about you. Can you talk to Sam about this thing? And we really want to get your opinion on it and blah, 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 blah. For 30 minutes, I spent burning up energy foolishly, thinking about I'm getting fired, what were they talking about, what were they saying, da 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 30 minutes of my life that I just spent in fear, spiraling out of control until I got back to the office and realized, oh, they were talking about how they wanted my opinion on something, right? And so this idea that we do not tire so easily for we're not burning up energy foolishly as we did, if the problem has been removed, if every opportunity is an opportunity to connect with God, then each moment that I'm provided is that relationship and that connection, that opportunity to turn, to course correct, to change my thinking, because I can't control my first thought, but I can control my second and my third, right? I can see when that first thought crops up and I can immediately connect with God and say, remove this thought from me and direct me to where you would have me be of service. Rather than burning up energy foolishly, rather than tiring myself out, rather than living in fear, right? How many times throughout our lives, throughout my day, does something happen? Every time my boss wants a meeting, I'm immediately fired. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know if you guys have that experience, but each time it's like, hold on, let's check this. I got to bring it back for a moment. This is what the call is about. This is the information I've been given. God help me be of service in this meeting. You know, and it's like, I don't know when that evaporates, but I know that there's a slow and steady decline of the time frame in which it holds me hostage. And so freedom from the bondage of self in step three becomes that way of life in my step 11, because now I'm learning the tools and using the tools day to day to be free, to find freedom. And so I'm undisciplined. I've never done anything other than sobriety consistently in my life. And so here I am today with all of you on this call, right? And I get to do this. I get to find ways to discipline myself. I'm a poor eater. I'm terrible in my yoga practice these days, right? Like I've got no self-discipline. You know, I could eat three slices of pizza and have a pint of ice cream and be perfectly happy. Instead, I push myself, I go to yoga, I work out, I do all these things, because what I realized today is how I treat myself, what I feed myself, how I live, what I eat spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, from the things that I watch on television, to the things that I read in the news, to what, to the people that I spend my time with, right? Like there is an energy in all of these things. And I'm either feeding myself for spiritual enlightenment and for spiritual growth or I'm feeding myself in a decline. And so I have to be really careful with how I live today in all of these areas because I'm so undisciplined, because I need God to discipline me. And discipline is not, right? Like it's not, um, it's not this. It's not, oh, I did bad, right? Like I'm not bad trying to get good. I'm sick trying to get well, right? And so that's my recovery today is seeking wellness a holistic approach to my sobriety in every opportunity that I've been given. And so <clears throat> this process of 10 and 11 and how they really work together in my life and how the power of the early steps really comes alive in, in this moment and this day to day is, is really the power of my program today. Like my 10 and 11 step become the foundation of where I live. And so I, I've only got about 13 minutes left, and I want to wrap up with, um, with something that happened today. So this morning, I had a 10 a.m. doctor's appointment, and um, I've been avoiding the doctor because that's what I do. I avoid until I get to the point where I know I have to go, and I got to take care of myself, and I got to do the things that I know to do, right? <clears throat> so I go to my doctor today, and my doctor found a lump in my breast. And I knew this was coming, 
and I knew I was going to have to get a, you know, a referral to go see another doctor to do the next round of things that need to be done. And I immediately felt a sense of warmth rush over my body. And I messaged my fiance and he was like, are you okay? Do you want to talk? When are you going to call? When are you going to go? Like went into all the, he's very, he's a lawyer. So he's very like checklist type of things. Like, let's just get it done. And I felt this warmth come over me because I know that no matter what I am taken care of. Now, I don't know whether the lump that I have in my breast is going to be cancer or not. I know there's a history of cancer on my father's side of the family. And it's something that I've thought about and I worry about, and I'm about to be 40, you know, but the warmth that came over my body was not, it's not cancer. I'm going to be taken care of. <clears throat> the warmth that came over my body was that even if it is cancer or something more serious, I'm still taken care of. That no matter what happens in my life today, God has got me. I've been placed in a position of neutrality, not just with my alcoholism, but in every area of my life. Having a relationship with a higher power doesn't mean bad things aren't going to happen. It doesn't mean I only get, I'm only fortunate enough to have good things, right? It means that whatever happens in my life today, I'm provided an opportunity to remain in that safe and protected neutral space. And that my faith, no matter what, continues to grow. No longer is it fear, right? It says in the fourth step, we commence to outgrow fear. The fear, again, it doesn't just evaporate or disappear. It's not just gone. It's that I commence to outgrow it. And so there is no fear in me as I sit here today and talk to you guys about this, right? I'm going to make the call. I'm going to go to the person that I was referred to. I'm going to get the thing that comes next and I'll continue to move forward with whatever happens. Is it scary? Yes. Is there a feeling that no matter what God's providing, that God is good, not some of the time, but all the time? That is constantly what I come back to today. And so as I'm in this, this sort of framework of today, I, I had, you know, I was, I came home after that and I worked from home the rest of the afternoon at about one o'clock. I was like, oh, I don't want to speak on this meeting. I've, I'm feeling so down. I'm feeling so low. I'm nervous. It's 10 and 11, big steps, blah, blah, blah. Haven't spoken in, you know, whatever. And, um, and yet I'm here and God provides and I get to be of service. And so with that, I know I've got 10 minutes left, but I, I really want to end on that note because I think that for me, it's continual proof of what God is doing for me and with me as I co-create my life with God. And that's the foundation of this 10th and 11th step for me is that every moment is an opportunity for me to draw closer, for all of us to just continue to draw closer to our creator. So with that, I know I've got some time, but I'm going to end it and turn it back over to the hosts. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.